Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on how to prevent P2P payment fraud in real time. Shirley Inskoe, Senior Analyst at IT Group and myself, Eric Tranley, VP of Product Management at Guardian Analytics will be the speakers for today's session. Some quick housekeeping before we start. Um, you should keep only one Bright Talk session browser open, otherwise you may have some echo. Uh, you can answer questions in the question box. We will address them either live and or by email. Uh, this webinar is recorded and you will receive a, a URL link notification. Please rate and suggest uh, improvement to our content for our next webinar series. Now, without further ado, um, let, uh, let me introduce Shirley Insko, Senior Analyst of IT Group. Shirley, do you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Shirley Insko. I've been with IT Group for six years, but my background is 30 years in retail banking at a top five U.S. bank where we um, envisioned, rolled out, and had a full, true enterprise fraud division where we performed everything from fraud prevention efforts to chart off processing, et cetera. Um, I have been with IT Group, as I said, for six years, and today I'm going to talk about preventing peer-to-peer -peer payment fraud in real time, which is a very hot topic in the market. So I want to welcome you all and uh, thank you for attending our webinar. Thank you, Shirley. So I'm Eric Tranley, Vice President of Product Management. I will go over after Shirley's presentation on how Guardian Analytics is preventing faster payment, one of which is P2P payment fraud, in real time with machine learning and behavioral analytics. Uh, I'm handing it over to you, Shirley, now. Thanks again, Eric. So today I'm going to talk about the growing importance of the mobile channel how payments are really evolving and the impact that that's having on fraud prevention. And then we'll talk about how to combat real-time payment fraud. And I'll summarize before handing it back over to Eric with some key takeaways. We often talk about real-time payments as though they're coming someday in the future. But in reality, they've already arrived. Consumers are using their mobile devices in more ways than they ever have before. Mobile banking has even surpassed online banking now. Two of the largest banks in the country are planning to introduce new products and services via the mobile channel first and then develop them for online. Consumers expect fast, easy, secure transactions and they want to be able to do them regardless of where they are or what time of day it is. Using their mobile device provides that convenience. Faster payments and real-time payments are evolving to meet market demand. Of course, the fraudsters don't want to be left out. They always target new payment methods. So when a new financial institution rolls out real-time payments, um, not be a surprise when fraud uh, rings target them. It should be expected and planned for. The reality is that many financial institutions aren't prepared for real-time payments because they don't have real-time fraud pre uh, prevention or detection capabil capabilities, uh, nor do they have the ability to interdict a real-time payment before it leaves their bank or credit union. This has got to change. Looking at this slide, um, you can see that, excuse me, I think I advanced two slides in error. Apologize. No, okay, apologize for that. Um, this slide shows uh, the market demand for P2P payments. As you can see here, in 2015, over $100 billion was moved in person-to-person -person payments and the projection in just a few short years by 2020 is that they will more than triple to over $316 billion. That's tremendous growth, tremendous market demand. And so it's important to recognize 
that if your financial institution isn't offering retail, uh, excuse me, faster payments and P2P payments, you could be at a disadvantage, particularly when it comes to attracting and retaining millennials and Generation Zers who are uh, more technologically sophisticated and want to use these types of payments. So payments are evolving and accelerating. Um, I, there are a lot of new payment types in the market, and, and new payment types continue to be introduced. I'm not going to talk about all of the ones mentioned on this slide. Uh, certainly this is not a comprehensive list. There are lots of others. But these are a few uh, that are being used on the slide. Some of these enable um, consumers to purchase goods, such as Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Walmart Pay. Uh, others are P2P payments, like um, Venmo, and Zelle is another one I don't have listed here. Um, the point is that there are a lot of different ones, and so uh, in addition to the payment capability, we're seeing far and uh, wide acceptance more than ever before of cryptocurrencies in the market. They really are becoming mainstream. I guess with Bitcoin being the kind of the grandfather of all the uh, cryptocurrencies, but others are coming uh, to the market and gaining popularity rapidly, and many consumers are choosing to invest in these. So in addition to the multitude of new types of payments, the, uh, the speed of payments is also accelerating. Just last September, NACHA introduced same-day ACH. Zelle is a, uh, a real-time P2P payment that I mentioned earlier. It enables people to transfer funds to another person in real time. And if the uh, consumer's financial institution doesn't offer Zelle, it's not a problem. They can just go to uh, the App Store and download it and use it via the app. There does have to be a participating financial institution on one end of the transaction, though. So either the financial institution sending the money or receiving the money has to be a Zelle participant. And, um, to make it easier for more and more financial institutions to join the network, the core processors are offering this to their financial institutions. So FIS, Fiserv, Jack Henry, they're all, uh, they've all partnered with Early Warning to offer Zelle. On the uh, business side, the Clearinghouse's real-time payments uh, launched last December. And primarily, these are payments that are originated by businesses. Um, to make, now, what differentiates the Clearinghouse's network is that it is an entirely new payment system. Uh, brand new payment rails that have not existed in the past. And so to make it easier for financial institutions to access these new payment rails, uh, they can use the SWIFT gateway to access um, the Clearinghouse's payment network. SWIFT is an international messaging and um, um, networking payment capability out of Belgium. And so many financial institutions use SWIFT, and rather than creating a new interface to the Clearinghouse, they can use that gateway to use the real-time payments uh, capability. I also want to mention the rise of payment hubs. Uh, you know, with all these different types of payments from the traditional ones, such as check, debit and credit cards, ACH and wire, to these new types of faster and real-time payments, these payment hubs have arisen. And a payment hub can be used by a merchant, uh, by a financial institution, or by any other type of uh, business or uh, nonprofit, et cetera, that, that generates a lot of payments. And what the payment hub does is that in an automated, very fast way in real time, it looks at the payment, how long you have to make the payment. Some payments, of course, are um, 
required to be faster than others, and assess the most cost-effective way to route that payment. So for example, if it has to be real-time, you wouldn't want to send it via ACH because even same day is not real-time. So all of these considerations are taken in effect by the hub and that payment, each individual payment is routed via the uh, most effective and least cost uh, method. So as you can imagine, with all of these um, new types of payments that are in the market, there's a lot of competition amongst them. This chart shows some of the most successful types of faster payments currently in the market and breaks them down uh, as to whether they're primarily being used for business to consumer payments or business to business payments or both, such as the ones where the circles intersect. Uh, so Pop Money, Zelle, and Square can be used for uh, any of those types of payments. An article I read earlier this week stated that they believe Zelle will overcome Venmo in 2018 in terms of both numbers of transactions as well as dollars moved. I think that's pretty significant because Zelle is so new to market. And hopefully, um, if you're a banker or if you work in a financial institution, hopefully that means that consumers have more confidence in a payment that is offered by their financial institution than by one that is not. I don't know that for a fact, for a fact but um, there does seem to be an inference given how rapidly Zelle has grown. Consumers demand um, ease of use and convenience, but they also do expect security. And security begins with ensuring your legitimate customer is using a faster payment and is not an account takeover impersonator. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a few minutes. So I'd like to share the results of some recent uh, research performed by ITEC Group. Uh, last July through September, we interviewed 28 executives from 19 of the largest U.S. and Canadian financial institutions. 37% of these financial institutions have assets from $25 to $99 billion. 42% had assets between $100 and $499 billion, and 21% have assets over $500 billion. So these are, uh, you know, your largest financial institutions that the research was conducted with. Among these uh, large financial institutions, digital channel fraud losses increased over the past two years in almost three quarters of them, or in 74%. Fraud losses were flat over the past two years in 21% and they decreased in 5%. All experienced fraud folks know that fraud never really goes away. When new controls are implemented in one area, the fraudsters just seek a new area of weakness. Organized criminal rings are run like a business and fraudsters are always seeking new opportunities. As mentioned earlier, um, faster payments represent one of those new opportunities that the bad guys are focusing on. So in looking at um, how fraud losses have increased in 74% of the financial institutions surveyed over the past two years, we asked what are your uh, primary types of losses that are occurring? Fraudsters are using a lot of different tactics to steal money. Um, the number one reason for loss is account takeover in the online and, did, and uh, mobile channels. 
Um, uh, excuse me. Account takeover occurs when a non-authorized user gains access to a customer's account. This can happen in a lot of different ways. For example, an impersonator can contact the call center of the financial institution over and over again until they're successful in impersonating the customer. And at that point, they may ask that the online credentials be reset. Another common way is um, using the um, compromised username-password combinations from numerous data breaches and using bots to just try those online credentials at a wide number of financial institution websites until they find one where they work. That takes very little effort because the automated bots are doing all the work. Of course, you can also use, or they can also use malware such as keystroke loggers or man in the middle attacks. I mean, I literally could go on and on about all the different ways account takeover can happen, but the, the important point is that it is the number one problem in the online and mobile channels. Second is application or new account fraud. It's really difficult to tell who's on the other side of a computer or a mobile device when they're applying for a new account and you have no history with that individual. Identity theft and the use of synthetic or manufactured identities has skyrocketed. Synthetic identities or manufactured identities used to be fairly easy to detect, but these criminal rings have learned to age the identities in order for them to pass third-party database and credit bureau queries. You can see the other top types of fraud losses here, mobile remote deposit capture, first-party fraud and scams, card not present fraud, and at 16% money movement. I suspect the next time I update this research, money movement will be higher on the list since few financial institutions had implemented faster payments when this research was conducted. Of course, I should also point out that losses aren't limited to, cus to consumer accounts. Um, on the commercial side, business email compromise fraud has reached all-time record levels. And that type of fraud occurs when a fraudster takes over the email of a very high-level executive in a business and then sends an email to some to an authorized person in the company instructing them to send a certain amount of money to a certain place, a certain other account. Um, and of course, because these requests usually come from the CEO or the president or somebody really high up in the company, the employee typically follows those instructions without question and that's when BEC fraud or business email compromise fraud is successful. I want to talk about authentication because it really can be viewed as the foundation for fraud prevention. And while you can't prevent first party fraud via strong authentication, at least you know who committed the fraud and you can attempt to collect the money. But if you can't determine who you're actually dealing with, you're highly susceptible to fraud attacks. A really good authentication strategy can also dramatically improve the customer experience. For example, if a customer contacts the call center to ask a product or fee related question, that person really doesn't need to be authenticated at all. But in most cases, they'll, they'll be asked two, three, or more knowledge based or out of wallet questions before they can be, uh, before they can even ask their question. The level of authentication required really should be tied to the level of risk of a specific transaction. This is commonly called orchestrating authentication. So it's not a one size fits all. It's literally looking at the risk of the transaction that is to be conducted and assessing what level of authentication is necessary here and tailoring that authentication. Doing this will dramatically improve the customer experience 
and still allow the financial institution to authenticate when and to the level needed. I think that's really important. And in this research, I learned that over two-thirds of the financial institutions are currently doing this to some degree, or they're planning to. Fraud prevention has also moved to mobile first in many financial institutions. Many of them are building their authentication strategy around the mobile channel. Mobile devices can be used to authenticate the customer regardless of the delivery channel. For example, a customer calling into the contact center can be sent a one-time password via a known device. The one-time password is given to the contact center agent and the time to pose multiple KBA or knowledge-based authentication questions is avoided. The customer's need is met much faster with less aggravation. Of course, if the customer wants a high-risk transaction, stepped-up authentication can still be used. Mobile devices offer a lot of information that can be used to help determine whether the customer is who they claim to be. The mobile device itself is one identifier, and it can be associated with a digital persona. Biometric features on a mobile device, such as fingerprint or facial recognition, can be used for authentication or to authorize a payment. The geolocation can be especially helpful in account takeover situations where transactions from multiple locations are initiated. Mobile network, provide, uh, excuse me, mobile, mobile network operator data can help overcome security concerns related to SMS text messages, and behavioral biometrics are especially good at detecting human versus machine behavior and activity that differs from the customer's typical profile. Okay, um, sorry, I had a moment's trouble getting that slide to advance. Some of the new tech, newer technologies that can be used as part of the authentication strategy are transparent to the customer, further improving the customer experience. A known device, again, associated with a specific customer who has used it in the past for activity that was never disputed is a powerful authentication weapon. Using behavioral analytics can help detect unusual transactional activity for a customer, and behavioral biometrics can help distinguish your normal customer's online or mobile behavior from online, uh, an online or mobile takeover uh, impersonator. I'm hearing from many fraud executives that they cannot get new fraud solutions that introduce friction into the customer experience approved. With superior transparent methods, approval should be easier to obtain, especially if they actually decrease current levels of friction, improving the customer experience. Here's a depiction of the ultimate goal, a seamless customer experience with high security levels. This chart shows high friction methods on the left moving up to very low or no friction methods on the right. The three shades of blue depict high, medium, and low levels of security provided by each method. So as discussed before, behavioral biometrics, behavioral analytics, and device identity are superior weapons in fighting fraud that have no negative customer impact. Very high friction methods, such as hard tokens and knowledge-based authentication questions, are being eliminated or their usage is being dramatically reduced in many financial institutions. I encourage each of you to look at all of the different tools you're currently using and see where they fall on this chart. Consider how you can improve security and the customer experience at the same time by replacing some older methods you're using with newer or improved technologies. Of course, there's no silver bullets. Nothing has ever been devised that is 100% foolproof, 
So layers of security will always be important. Make full use of internal data. One example is data from your information security groups. The data they have related to hacking and probing attacks may provide intelligence that you can use to combat an impending fraud attack. Using such data can help you be prepared to defend against the attack when it's launched. Examine login security. Outdated static username and password combinations are of little value from a security perspective. Biometrics are gaining a lot of traction in the market and are more and more acceptable to consumers, especially if they're stored on the mobile device. Consider the transparent solutions if you aren't currently using them. And last, consider methods for stepped up authentication for high risk activity. It's important that the, uh, the stepped up authentication measures you use be especially strong methods. So for example, with KBA, and I don't mean to pick on KBA, but it's, um, it just cries out to be picked upon. Uh, if you're just using um, knowledge based authentication questions alone, in former research, I've had um, many executives tell me that up to 15% of their legitimate customers cannot answer the questions, while the fraudster will just keep trying over and over again until they get questions they have the answers to. So that's not very um, encouraging to think of that being used in a stepped up authentication um, where high risk is uh, present. So if you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear this. If you don't currently have real-time uh, fraud detection and the ability to interdict transactions in real-time before they leave your financial institution, your methods of combating fraud are outdated. Start now to build a business case to move your fraud prevention efforts into the current environment. On that note, it's important to consider, or excuse me, it's important to educate executive management that business cases for fraud prevention must also change. Historically, um, the way to build a business case for a new fraud prevention or authentication method was to take existing losses as the primary factor in your business case. But if you think about that for a minute, it's not very practical. For example, if you implement real-time payments or faster payments in your organization without already having fraud detection and transaction interdiction capabilities, the fraudsters are going to know this. They talk to each other, they're organized, and they're going to tell all their bad guy friends that you don't have the proper protections in place and your financial institution will become a major target. So if you start then accumulating loss numbers, it won't take you long to have enough for a business case. The problem comes in that the committee to hear business cases may not meet for a few months, and even after you gain approval for your business case, you still have to identify the, the right solution for you and have an implementation project. During all of that time, you're continuing to be attacked and continuing literally to bleed funds. So um, educating executive management about the need for protection before you implement faster payments and the ability to improve the customer experience is a really important step. Machine learning models are tremendous in fighting fraud because not only do they continuously improve based on the feedback, but they also can help really reduce false positives that some of the older historical systems generate. Um, regulators tend to prefer supervised models. Um, they are not very familiar with machine learning and can be critical. It's important that you be able to explain the models you use, particularly in the AML area, even more so than in fraud. In the AML area, the regulators are really worried that a model might miss an alert that would have been detected previously. 
And in the fraud area, they're more concerned about the potential for disparate uh, treatment, perhaps unintended disparate treatment, but nonetheless, they're going to want to make sure the model isn't leading to that. So if you're not familiar with your institution's payment windows, you know, for ACH, for wire transfer, et cetera, familiarize yourself with those payment windows. Use every minute of time you can in uh, working alerts and make sure that alerts are prioritized so that the most risky uh, alerts that have the least amount of time to work are, are worked first. Um, with your real-time fraud detection, you should be able to suspend a payment until it can be looked at and determined whether or not it's authorized. And then if it is authorized, you can release it. If it's not, of course, you can discard it. Um, consider auto-decisioning some of these alerts that are of lower risk. Um, as you as you gain confidence in your models, you can really cut down the amount of time that's needed to work all these alerts by auto-decisioning some of them. And that can go either way. It can be that you auto-decision the absolute highest risk ones or the lowest risk ones that are detected to let some of those go and stand. Um, so I, again, I could talk on and on about this, but it's really important because it is a whole new world. And if you don't, if you aren't currently using these um, newer forms of technology and these newer tools, it's going to put your institution at a competitive disadvantage, and your losses are really going to rise. One other trend we always see with organized crime is that as some institutions, usually the largest ones because they have more money to spend on fraud solutions, as they put solutions in place to combat new types of fraud and stymie these attacks, then the fraud trickles down to smaller institutions. It never fails. They don't give up. They don't say, oh, well, um, we'll have to find a legitimate way of making a living. They just move to unprotected institutions. And again, uh, these criminal rings talk to one another. They know which institutions have tools in place and which do not. And so um, you really do have to expect to be targeted if you're out there offering some of these new payment types in an unprotected manner. So I want to wrap this up and go over some key takeaways at this point. Um, the threat environment continues to escalate with, with new payments, faster payments, ongoing data breaches, um, increased mobile functionality because banks are you know, bringing new capabilities to the mobile device. Um, this all will just help the fraud rates continue to escalate and the fraud attack rates. The mobile device can be a big tool in combating fraud taking advantage of that mobile device and all the other uh, ancillary opportunities is important. You have to have sound strategies in place before you implement real-time payments or your fraud will absolutely mushroom. Ensure your fraud processes are adaptable. Fraud changes. The, uh, the techniques change, the dollar amounts change, lots of things change quickly, and you have to be able to make adjustments. Review your authentication strategies and update your customer contact information as part of your faster payments implementation project. I've talked to several executives who have already implemented faster payments and are offering it to their customers. And over and over again, I've heard we, we weren't authenticating our customers well, so there's account takeovers, and then the money is moved out via Zelle or some other faster payment faster than ever before. And the second thing I've heard is that when we suspended the payment, we tried to contact our customer and discovered the email address, the phone number that we had were outdated. So it's a really good idea to update your customer information system and ensure that you have current contact information for your customers. 
Um, and then don't employ too much friction. There are lots of good ways to properly um, create your authentication strategies and do very strong fraud prevention without a tremendous amount of customer friction. And customer experience is more important today than it's ever been before. And at this point, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Eric to give some additional information about Guardian Analytics and the solutions they provide. Thank you, Shelley. Let me walk you through what does Guardian Analytics do. Uh, we're all about behavioral analytics and machine learning to detect fraud, to alert fraud operations, and to stop fraudulent account activities. Behavior analytics applied to fraud means that we can self-learn individual user behavior, we can detect anomalous user activities, we can adapt to new threats, and we don't depend on rules. We monitor hundreds of events and attributes in real time. Guardian Analytics at a glance is about 450 plus financial institution, 40 million commercial retail account holders, and an annual volume of banking uh, activities of about 5 billion transactions. Now let's let me go back to one of the key slides of Shirley, which is what is the how we can balance the risk and the friction for payments. And let me go through a couple of definition. Behavioral biometrics is about identifying people by how, what they do, by how they do, what they do, rather than by what they are, such as fingerprint or face, or what they know, secret question, password, or what they are what were they prompting to enter, such as a talk, token or MS, SMS one-time code. So biometrics is truly about identifying people by how they do things as opposed to how what they do. Behavioral patterns is about designing the system to understand the normal behavior of each individual account holder, calculate the risk of each new activity, and enable real-time intervention commensurate to the risk. Device identity is about a fingerprint of the device, which is going to bring a set of information on both the device and the user profile. The goal is to create a digital identity which can be used as a fingerprint of a mobile or desktop device. Now, Guardian Analytics is about enabling friction right and real-time intervention for faster payment. We want to enable frictionless fraud detection friction right prevention and enable a real-time intervention to basically close the loop. And of course, the whole basis is about on machine learning behavior analytics where we self-learn the individual user behavior, we adapt to new threat, we don't use rules, and we monitor hundreds of attributes at a time. Now, when it comes to faster payment, Shirley has spoken about P2P, but there's a whole set of themes on faster payment. One is P2P, as you know, mostly non-commerce payment, account to account, where the customer receives in minutes the funds. But you have also P2B, person to business, whereby you have immediate bill payments, e-commerce purchases to pay, you know, uh, accounts such as utilities, DMV, charitable organization, so on and so forth. You have also business to business payment, where you have just-in-time payment to suppliers with immediate bill payments, where the supplier receives the funds transferred to the account directly. This is actually one of the, the key uh, faster payment theme for business velocity, uh, whereby the businesses can transact very quickly amongst each other. And then there's also business to person, Mostly payroll, such as temporary employee wages, when you need to set up very quick payroll and transfer the funds to the workers. And this is where uh, the, the, the hacker comes in, really. Because in this example that I'm taking, which is a P2P ACH funds transfer, so person to person, what's happening is you have an ecosystem whereby a bank A, for example, one of your, your bank, would be participating to a P2P service together with another bank B, which is, for example, the, the, the recipients of the funds. And around this, you're going to select a couple of payment type, bill pay for uh, P2B, online, mobile. Uh, and, and what's going to happen really is if the P2P is about a customer one that transfer very quickly and, uh, funds to a customer two, 
which accounts are linked via the P2P servers, the reality is there's a whole set of conventional uh, money in, money out, where bank A would debit customer account one of $150, for example, here, and message the P2P servers, and the funds being moved to a settlement account. And then bank B would create customer two of $150 and message the P2P service too. Uh, and then at the end, there's a settlement between bank A and bank B. And this is really in a nutshell, but what is the key point to understand here when fraud comes along is customer one transferred the funds to customer two in minutes, but the settlement itself may take hours. I mean, at least a minimum of 24 hours which means that as a froster, is the froster can come in, and this is what the next slide is about. Froster likes to compromise and, and, and uh, basically get the, the money out quick uh, without the ability for you to intervene. So they would compromise on various fronts. Uh, for P2P, anything that uses mobile and online, obviously allow account, online account takeover, device account takeover, especially after Equifax breach, there's a lot of uh, personal accounts and business accounts that are actually in on the dark web uh, that get, they could take over. Uh, but then there's also other things that they are doing, like email compromise, uh, uh, sending instruction uh, to change recipient of HEH or wire, or uh, social engineering with phishing and malware. These are all the methods of compromise that you can see they're almost limitless. So for us to protect you, Guardian Analytics has a couple of layers. There's at least three layers that we uh, categorize in the frictionless that basically enable to stop online account takeover uh, and, and detect device account takeover. Uh, we proceed with device fingerprinting, and we're going to talk about it in a second. Then we have another layer around authentication and logging risk model. We have another layer around account activity, like you know, creation of account, deleting of account, changing of passwords. And th those external models that works with behavioral analytics and machine learning protects you in a frictionless manner around uh, uh, on account takeover. And then from the inside, we have payment models, risk models that applies to any transaction that happens to go through because you know the smarter hacker and froster would actually go by this and, and will go and start to change uh, recipient and transaction or, or, or you know any other kind of uh, fraudulent activity. We would detect them, either they are doing a, a, a recipient change or an ACH batch manipulation here, a wire manipulation. Uh, we will also distinguish bill pay events here to uh, understand uh, if there is any deviation. And we also have online and mobile risk model as well as P2P transfer risk model. The key thing here, as you can see, is looks like a hub because you can have multiple channels coming in. You can actually have multiple ACH channel for that, for that matter. But we, you have a uniform way to measure the fraud so your fraud detection team can react and you can real time intervene. In other words, the machine learning Behavioral analytics will let go, run it through all the, the legit transaction in a frictionless manner, but will hold the fraudulent ones for your team to go and intervene. In other words, your fraud team can, in a multi-channel fashion, uh, work only on what matters the most to them. And this is the concept of friction write and real-time intervention, whereby you can intervene on it, but via API, you could send out the risk score to a cybersecurity layer, for example, for them to basically, uh, you know, uh, increase the, the friction in terms of uh, MFA or, or asking more questions in terms of password. But they would do it afterwards as opposed to right now they're doing from the get go. This is, these are the kind of use case uh, we have right now at Guardian Analytics. Uh, as you can see, there's all kind of platform we have from wire to ACH, from P2B and P2P, such as bill pay, P2P transfer, account to account transfer from, from Fiserv. Uh, we have other online platform, mobile platform. We have a very flexible way to, to integrate those platforms, but these are actual use cases that we have uh, running on our customer base. Now, to walk you through what device fingerprinting is, because we, we talk a little bit and it's a little bit abstract, but these are all the parameters, for example, we're taking out of any iPhone, Android, or any kind of mobile phone you have. And what we're doing is basically we, we catch the profile of those devices, and if they happen to change, and usually you don't upgrade your phone that often as a normal user, but the hacker doesn't know that, he will probably come in with a phone that is different than yours, and we detect those deviations. 
Um, and as for the risk models itself, in terms of authentication here, you, you have the, the behavior of a normal login, uh, logout risk model uh, of, let's say, yourself or, or your employees and uh, on day of the week and uh, hour of the day. And we will capture that, record it, and baseline it. And you can see here, we would detect deviation. Like, you know, this is not a pattern that happens often. So we will red score it. And uh, it, that this is how the, the, the authentication risk model works to detect that the login and logout that you have done is suspicious. Now let's dive a little bit in here uh, as to how we uh, operationalize those detection of risk so that the fraud team can intervene. So as the machine learning and behavior analytics works on the back, you can see all the activities of logging failure, logging fail are being actually recorded, but you know some of them are just uh, the fact that you have forgotten your password. And you can see here they're all green because you know it it so it happens, but not that often. Uh, and the risk factors we're measuring is what you're doing with your operating system in terms of changes, the user agent, the, the browser configuration, and the location where you're logging in. And as you can see here, you, we have detected a logging failure where the user got locked. So yourself got locked out. Uh, we also detected it's an unusual, unusual browser configuration and at an unusual location with, uh, and with another network provider. That raised the risk. Uh, to a, a high level of alert, which is red here, uh, and it combines with other uh, parameters just at the location and the network. Uh, we also analyze other attributes in that device. You can see here is the provider uh, and the fact that uh, it used to you were connecting, logging most of the time with Windows 10 and or Android, and all of a sudden you have switched to iPhone with another Safari browser here. Uh, that goes also with the versions of browser here. You've been doing Mozilla with Windows NT and Linux, and all of a sudden it switched to iPhone. That also increased the risk. So how we go about implementing friction right with what you have just seen. Just imagine a second that we have a payment hub here and an ACH platform. You remember this is <coughs> just a, a faster payment that happens to use ACH for settlement on the back. And here, when integrating with one of the cybersecurity layer, uh, which is IBM Trust here, you have a logging time customer. And let's say, imagine that the foster has stolen his credential and able to get in. At that point, there's a couple of things that happen. Um, Trustee would alert that you know there's a there's a denial of access here, and what happened is we're capturing it. We have a device fingerprinting that say. There has been an MFA first time around where the, the, the cybersecurity tool has uh, sent out uh, a multi-factor authentication saying, please give us more information. And what's happening is if the froster happens to breach that, which he may because with uh, ATO and uh, Equifax, he would have uh, the other uh, credential to get in, we will detect if he's doing any fraudulent activity on the ACH fat batch itself like manipulating those natural files. At that point, we will raise the risk and basically give the ability to the fraud team or uh, the risk intervention team to accept, hold, or reject the transaction. At this point in time, all the transaction and risk factors are being measured and being looped in to be sure that the team has enough information to accept, hold, or reject uh, the transaction. In summary, Guardian Analytics is about a frictionless fraud detection a friction right prevention, a real-time intervention using behavior analytics and machine learning so that you can self-learn the user behavior, adapt to new threats, and do not depend on rules, monitor hundreds or even an attribute in real time. If you want to learn more, uh, we will encourage you to go to our website uh, or uh, basically, we have selected a couple of information here for you on digital banking. We have uh, other uh, solution that we're inviting you to, to 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 watch and to learn. So these are all the bit.ly that you can you can enter to um, access those resources. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar on how to prevent real-time fraud on P2P event.